So, who do I have a pleasure to talk to? This is Arwen. This is <laughs> <laughs> and this is Mike. We're the two coordinators at Maximum Rock and Roll. Yeah. Uh, I guess we should start with a history of the magazine. It's been going for a long, long time, so uh, please tell the basics we should know. Sure. Um, the magazine started in 1982. It was actually a radio show before it was a magazine. And a compilation was released called Not So Quiet on the Western Front. It was an LP. And they put together a very elaborate insert. It was a compilation of bands. Um, and punk bands, of course. And the insert became the very first Maximum Rock and Roll. Yeah. And then they decided to make a monthly magazine out of it. And we've been going strong since 1982 without stopping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when did you guys join the Maximum team? Um, I got here in 1998, so I've been here for, I've done a little over 50 issues. Yeah. And I got here in uh, October of 2000, and I've done 33 issues, yeah. <laughs> something like that. And uh, Arwen got, you got here, like, what, like, Six months after Tim passed away. Yeah, that's about right. A little bit longer. Yeah, maybe we should talk about that. Like uh, the founder of the magazine died a couple of years ago. So uh, did it change a lot? And uh, well, tell something about that. Like how it affected on this whole thing. Um. Well, I don't know. It. Tim did the magazine for about. Was it sixteen years? And he was the coordinator for from from the be from the beginning. He was also the one that uh, primarily did the radio show, uh, started the radio show in '77. And um, I don't know. I think that. I mean, I think the magazine has always been changing and growing, and like this sort of like the way punk is going, you know. But I think there is some basic basic values behind it, and basic um, like. In, stressing the independence issue and the stressing the importance of staying uh, independent from major corporations and uh, what and also what it covers I mean I think that aspect of it has the spirit of the magazine has always stayed the same even after Tim passed away yeah. so there was definitely a period of transition afterward because Maxim Rock and Roll was so infused with Tim's personality that it was uh, it went through a period of rocky times yeah. there was even discussion of oh should we keep you know the magazine going I wasn't here at the time but <clears throat> and people decided that yes that it was actually bigger than Tim it was bigger than this one individual and it was still really a, a viable and you know essential thing for the punk community so there was a there were a few years there where it was it was difficult it needed to find its voice and its personality again after suffering that blow but I think it's really come around yeah, yeah. Uh, there's been lots of people working for the magazine, so how do these old people who don't do it anymore, how do they take your job? Like, how, how, how do they feel about you you doing your work? <laughs> oh man, they're just glad someone's here to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, we still have some of the people who've been here since the very beginning. One of our reviewers, Steve Spinelli, is one of the original people who did the, the radio show. show and, and yeah. Yeah, I and mean, there's still, and, and even a lot of people who don't actually work for the magazine are still involved in the larger community, and they're around, and they're um, great resources for us. So people, I think people really accept the change well, and um, they just want someone who's going to be reliable and who really understands Maximum's best interest, you know, and understands what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge amount of people working here, so how do you guys keep it all together? It must be really hard. <laughs> how do we, uh, we yell at people a lot. Keep it all together, yeah. yeah that's keep, what we do. That's what we do. Uh, well, I mean, everything's based on deadlines, and uh, most people know it's really important to try to keep those deadlines, and so there's a pretty rigid organizational you know, level to everything, and the, everything's put together like a good, good structure for everything. And um, and when people are late, we just yell at them. I guess <laughs> I don't know. Like that's sometimes. most of what we do, actually, more than I mean, we do layout and editing and interviewing and all those things. But the essence of our job is to harass people yeah. all the time. We're always on the phone and email, and to make sure that other people 
all those 70 or 80 people who work for the magazine do their little thing, their little piece, their you know record reviews or their layout or whatever, and we just make sure that it all comes together. Yeah. And we have you know a system of organizing or disorganizing yeah. <laughs> that seems to work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, like uh, I've, I've noticed that uh, there's a lot of people coming here and doing their job on the back room there and then they go but do, do all the people writing for the magazine do they do it here or do some of the people just send their stuff in from somewhere else all the reviewers do it here yeah. um, most of the columnists are from all over the country and they'll just, they just send in their columns uh, most of the content in the magazine is just sent in from people uh, who interviewing bands that they like um, and so most of the interviews in the magazines or the articles are sent in from, you know, all over the world. Like, you know, it just depends on where the bands are from, really. Yeah. So, I mean, most, and like I said, you know, it's, it's mostly contributor-based, mm -hmm. the guts of the magazine, so. Uh, do you guys get, like, a lot of interviews sent in that you won't publish? And uh, what's your politic with them? Well, basically, the only reason that we won't run an interview at all well if it's just really terrible yeah. we won't run it you know and that that really does happen um also if it's a band that we don't review in the magazine yeah. or something yeah. then we don't run it i mean it has to be something that we've covered and they've also sent us something so you know yeah. um and then uh, t tell t tell something about your review policies there's like you guys are quite strict with the stuff you will review and whatnot um well, we only have a few tenets, and one of them is it has to be independently produced. It has to not be on a major label and not be on a label that has ties to a major label. Um, and it has to be punk. Yeah. Those are the two things. And yeah, we do, you know, because of those rules, we do decide what's punk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is not to say that we, we say that, you know, this band belongs in the punk scene, this band doesn't belong in the punk yeah, scene. Yeah. It's just musically, this fits here. Yeah. And then it's not about whether we like the band or we agree with their politics or whatever. It's like, if you open up the magazine, you should be able to see every new punk release yeah, in there. Yeah. That's, that's what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the bands that, uh, are like, uh, that you guys publish an interview of and then they become like really mainstream. I remember seeing like a well, white, white Stripes interview. Well, there's Offspring on the cover of, over there on the wall. Or but the yeah. Briefs or, uh, yeah, it's happened quite yeah. a few times. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just um, bands change, you know, and what they're all about and bands, uh, for lack of a better word, sell out and it just, <laughs> it just happens, you know, and we, um, I mean, and you, you don't know that is going to happen when you do the inter when you do the interview, you know, because like it happens years later or, you know, or two years later or whatever. You don't know when it's going to do it. You know, you, and I don't I think if you were running around worried about who's going to sell out next, yeah. like you, you go crazy, you yeah. know, because yeah. I mean, what personally what I'm primarily interested in doing is, you know, it bums me out. Like it makes me sad. And but I, that that happens. But. I mean, what I'm really concerned of doing is, is supporting and perpetuating like bands that aren't a part of that and are a part of, you know, actually a part of punk, you know, and supportive of like the underground scene. And so there's always going to be some bands that take advantage or, you know, use the, the DIY punk network to get somewhere bigger and better. Yeah. There's always going to be a few people who do that. And sometimes, I mean, there's plenty of bands that come through here that have a sound that could get them famous. Mm -hmm. But most of those bands are never going to do that. They're going to stay, you know, they're going to stay in the, in the punk scene. Yeah, yeah. A uh, year or two ago, there was a, quite a change with your distribution. Like, uh, tell something about that and how has it uh, worked, worked out in the end? Oh, man. Well, um, we left Mordam which Maximum had been with for 14 years, 15 years, since about 85. Yeah. Um, we left Mornam because Mornam had decided to, we were in an exclusive relationship with Mornam, mm -hmm. and they decided to change what they distribute to now they will uh, distribute records that have connections to major labels. Mm -hmm. And we didn't feel like we could be a part of that anymore um, because it runs it's contradictory to what you know the magazine's about, and so we left about a year ago, and 
it's been really rough <laughs> for a while because we had to completely rebuild our distribution and learn how to do everything, you know, because from scratch, just yeah. start over. And um, I think now, I mean, we didn't, I think it, it's been rough and, you know, we've been going large stretches of time without getting payments from distributors because it's just starting over with distributors. But I think now we've kind of recovered and it's sort of come around the corner, I guess, a year later, you know, because it's been, it's been one year now since yeah. we left. Okay. And, um, Only a year. <laughs> yeah, it seems like so much longer than a year. But um, I think that, um, I mean, our distribu distribution now is the same as it was through Mornam yeah. when we left Mornam. Uh -huh. So I don't really see the problem. And I think it's, it's going up, you know, and it, there's more magazines getting to Europe now than there were when we were with Mornam. And um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a good thing. So, yeah, yeah it's, um, in a way, I mean, you didn't really explain what Mordam is, but Mordam oh. is one of the largest independent distributors, um, although now they're not so independent anymore. Mm -hmm. But they started in a very close relationship with Maxim Rock and Roll. Yeah. They were basically the same people, the same group of people, um, and they, they both institutions came out of the same, um, the same community. Yeah. And so when they started making it was all the more of a big deal that they took that direction yeah. and we had to separate you know from it and um and kind of go our own way but part of that is really feels really good because we're no longer in that kind of dependent relationship with them that a lot of people are like we don't just wait for the checks to come yeah. we're like we have another uh, coordinator who's not here her name is clara and she's she hiding, she actually. lives here too and she's our distribution coordinator and that's what she does yeah. and she has a relationship with everybody that she sells magazines to yeah. so now we have it's much tighter like we're much more in connection with people who sell like 15 copies all over the world yeah. you know well i wish all over the world but you know in a lot of places and so i don't know it feels very much more in touch than we were before yeah uh, uh, tell me how how big is the print run of the magazine, and like if if it can be like found all over the world, or if there's like places you can't find it. Um, we print right now about nine thousand a month, yeah. um, <coughs> and uh, I mean, there's places you can't find it in South Africa. You can, you know, but I mean, for the most part, like you can find it all over Europe. You can find it all over the United States. You can find it all over Canada. You can find it, you know, there's places that I wish we could get better distribution in. Like I wish, uh, there's a large punk scene in Malaysia and in the Philippines, and I wish we could get magazines there. Not so much so that um, we're selling magazines to these people. It's more so if people in those places see the magazine, then they'll want to send stuff to the magazine to be reviewed and so we can write about it and so people in the United States or in Europe will know about it, mm -hmm. what's going on there. Um, I think that's one of the most important things about Max Rock and Roll and Definitely. I think what makes it different than, you know, a lot of other American pu like punk or publications or bigger zines is that to me it's like I, want, I don't want it to be an American magazine or an American zine. I want it to cover everything. I want it to cover punk from Malaysia. I want it to cover punk from you know, South America, from yeah, everywhere. So, um, I mean, we're working on trying to find ways. It's just, right now, the postage is our biggest obstacle. It's mm -hmm. it's so expensive, the mail, because it's so big, you know? And, uh, but I mean, I think the distribution is pretty good. And you can pretty much, if you want it, you can pretty much get it anywhere, Yeah. you know? And the way we've set it up to help that process is that we sell little bundles of you know yeah. five to fifteen magazines so that if you're just some kid in Singapore and you want you know about maximum and you want people to have it yeah. but there's no distribution network set up yeah. you can just buy them at some affordable rate where you can still sell it and at a price that people can afford and you can still make enough money and yeah. we can still make enough money and everybody's happy and then it's in Singapore yeah. I mean if you sell ten copies in Singapore that's a lot, you know, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, and every copy figure gets read by, you know, goes to some punk house, sits on the toilet, and gets read by 10 people, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so we really would like to be everywhere, but yeah. little by little. Yeah. Uh, you guys sent uh, uh, issues for free to prisoners and uh, to some libraries, am I right? Or uh, To libraries, oh, but, yeah. but uh, not, not prisoners. Oh, yeah? Because there's, uh, there's too many 
it costs too much to mail it, the, and there would be too many prisoners to yeah. get it. Um, we can't. We can send this really cheap rate uh, uh -huh. to libraries and info shops and stuff uh, yeah. like bulk mail. But when we send it to prisoners, we can't even use the media mail rate. We actually have to send it first class. Oh, okay. So it costs us like two fifty um, a magazine, yeah. um, which of course is like we lose money. Yeah. yeah. So and and uh, th what we do usually is we send a list of to prisoners who request magazines, we send them a list of, of publishers and organizations that send free uh -huh. books and magazines. Okay, yeah. And some of those people actually, um, I know, get Max Rock and Roll and we'll send them to prisoners yeah. if they can. You know, if it's like the Books Through Bars or <coughs> other, there's all these other prisoner support networks. I know about them together, like the Anarcho Bookshop mm -hmm. here. Um, the magazines that are left over at the end of the month, instead of returning them to us, they just put them in their pile of things to send the prisoners. So, I mean, that's how we handle that. I mean, we, because it is pretty cost prohibitive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Maximum is more than just magazine. Yeah, like you guys still do that uh, radio show. And uh, I was like two days ago, I was at the photo show you guys had like sort of organized. So uh, tell something that you like that's behind the pages, like what is there connected to the magazine or what do you personally do besides Maximum? Um, well, I think that Mike and I and, and Clara also are pretty connected to the rest of the scene in mm -hmm. the Bay Area and, and larger than that as well. But so Mike puts on, helps book shows sometimes at Gilman Street, sets stuff up for bands. We have bands um, come through here and kind of like visit the house and what we said the photo show was something that actually a group of shit workers set up Mike and I really weren't too involved in in setting it up yeah. but it was a bunch of old pictures from our archives that are just awesome just really cool stuff that were printed in old scene reports and interviews and stuff yeah. of bands from all over the world doing like crazy you know jumps and whatever uh, and these shit workers took them blew them up and we had this this show and a bunch of like people who hadn't been out to see anything in a long time I think like yeah. a bunch of old punk rockers came out yeah. <laughs> and checked it out and we just started doing the radio show again um, that was spearheaded by Paul Curran and Mike works on it a lot and Rob and Chloe we have a, a group of people who do it and we we record the shows here yeah. play a lot of stuff and yeah so we have a website it seems like we're just there's a lot of great energy going on right now yeah. yeah and like the, ra the radio show like we just started working on getting it syndicated again because it was the radio show started in 77 which is like it started before the magazine started and uh, it was syndicated out to about like at its peak about 50 or 60 stations across the world and we've just started like we it took a while learning how to do it again because <laughs> none of us had really done it and so it's, we just started getting it syndicated now and it's it's up to about like four or five stations in the US that are playing it and we've really just started working on that and um, and just this week uh, it's going to get back on the air here in the Bay Area which is really good I'm very excited about that and but you can also listen to it online and it gets about three to four thousand visitors a week online listening to it so um, it's really exciting I mean it, I think it's a good thing too because People can read about the records all they want in the magazine and kind of imagine what they sound like, but they can go online or they can listen to it on the on the airwaves and hear what these, these bands actually sound like. And we play a lot of records. We just um, from all over the world, you know, and records that a lot of people will never find or never see uh, because we get a lot of those records, you know. So uh, it, I think it's really, you know, I don't know, I think it, I think that thing is a really important thing for us to be doing, and so. You know, it helps out a lot of bands, and it. Yeah. So, uh, if people in Finland want to listen to the show, what's the address to go to? Uh, if you go to the, the website, which is yeah. maximumrockandroll.com, and then there's a link to the radio show. Mm -hmm. So it's just maximum rock, and, and then the letter N, and then roll.com. <laughs> yeah. And if you go there, there's a link to the radio show, and you can you can listen to it there. You can download it as an MP3, or you can stream it. You know, yeah. either way. Um, and we do a new show every week, and it's about an hour long. Yeah, so. it's really cool. Like if we if there's a band in town, we have guest DJs, and mm -hmm. yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you just said like uh, that you get lots of records in, and you have fucking huge collection of <laughs> records. Tell us something about that. It it covers pretty much everything that's been released like within 
fucking 20 years um yeah <laughs> there's about i think it's like 40 to 50,000 records here um and it's not every record that's ever come in for review uh tim right before he died got rid of a lot of records to try to keep the record collection under control mm -hmm. so it get, wouldn't get so big that it couldn't fit in a house yeah um that you know, every record we review goes into the collection and so people can listen to it for, you know, it's like a library of punk records. Yeah. So, and it's, it's pretty massive. Yeah. So, yeah. and there's green tape on all of them and yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So what's the reason for the green tape? The, the record collection actually started with Tim Johannan's personal collection in oh. the sixties of like, you know, weird hippie bands and stuff that he collected. And the story goes that he, there was some other cool collector guy who put tape on the outside of his records and Tim just thought that was a neat idea yeah. and started doing it, this green duct tape around the edges of the records. Yeah. And then his personal collection grew into the Maximum Rock and Roll collection. Yeah. And they continued, he continued to put the green tape around it. And after a while, it became not only a matter of tradition, but also a way to mark that the records belong to this library. Yeah. So we actually have gotten <clears throat> calls from record stores like, hey, there's somebody trying to sell a record with green tape on it. And yeah. we'll be like, what's the record? Oh, never mind. That's cool. It, that was some metal record that got purged from the uh, collection. Yeah. It's OK. But people can recognize that they belong yeah. to us. Yeah. I, I guess there's, there is like some records missing from there. Like yeah. even, even there is this green tape. Yeah, I mean, a lot of records got stolen when, when Tim passed away, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, we trust a lot of people with the records. And it, uh, you trust that people aren't going to take them. But yeah. if it happens, it happens. And there's not, you know, we, we can try to figure out who took them. But, you know, and... There's so yeah. many of them, it's, car it's hard to keep track of every record, you know, that's here, because there's so many records, and they get misfiled, and you think they're stolen, but are missing, and then you find them yeah. three years later. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you think about it, actually, there, there only have been a, a few records stolen over yeah. the course of many, many years, and the amount of people who use the library, it's really pretty impressive. It's because people have respect for the fact that, even if, even if they don't like the magazine or whatever, but they have respect for the fact that this is the largest punk collection in the world and that they have access to it, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. So, and it needs to stay in one piece, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, it's crazy. You can come here and listen to the, all the stuff you can't ever find. And uh, it's there like yeah. original versions. Yeah. So yeah. you guys are lucky to live in a house <laughs> like that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's about it. I'm off to the airport soon. <laughs> So, nice you. <laughs> yeah. so uh, I, I want to wish many years to come for the magazine and, uh, and uh, thanks a lot for your hospitality here and uh, yeah, keep up, keep up the good work. <laughs> thanks, thanks, we <laughs>